This happened about ten years ago. I was attending a really crappy university. Rent and gas money were killing me financially. I really needed a job to survive. It was the summer of my second year. It was one of the hottest days of the year. On days like that, I always went to study on campus to enjoy the free aircon. In the library, they have a bulletin board where anyone can post any personal adverts, etc. I checked the board because sometimes you could pick up some easy work. For example, high school students looking for a tutor. Other times there would be interesting adverts too. Once I saw a note saying, study a foreign language with me. I like the sense of community. When I approached the board that day, I saw the following advert. Cleaner wanted to help clean my apartment. 5,000 yen per half day. Please contact Mr. Tanaka. This was some good timing because I had just taken a test and I was about to have a week off. 5,000 yen was a lot to me. It's about $45. That would get me back to my hometown for a couple of days, I thought. As soon as I got back to my dorm, I immediately called the number provided. Hi, I'd like to apply for the cleaning job you posted. The voice on the other end of the line responded. It sounded quite bewildered. Oh, right. What days can you work? I told him I'd work the full amount advertised. Oh, right, right. Uh, well, can you start 9am next Tuesday? I agreed, and he gave me the address. It sounded like a residential area. I guessed by his voice. He was in his thirties. He sounded a little sick over the phone. My first day of work arrived. The morning was hot, and the sky was free of clouds. When I arrived at Mr. Tanaka's house, I felt the breeze of his air con. I was worried I was going to be working without one. I arrived ten minutes early, at 8.50. Rang the doorbell, and a man came and answered it. Right on time. Come on in, he said. He was a bit awkward, not one for chatting, and he wouldn't look me in the eyes when we spoke. I took off my shoes and followed him into his house. He explained what he needed. It was pretty easy stuff. Help with moving something heavy, trips to the garbage dump, and some other light cleaning work. I was shocked by the things he was throwing away. It may have been trash to him, but to a student like me, they were treasures. He must have seen me admiring these things, because he said, If you want to keep anything, that's fine. It's yours. So I sorted some things into a keep pile. I can't remember exactly what they were. I think there were some games, some books, maybe a dirty magazine too. <laughs> we were cleaning the room at a decent pace. I was kind of enjoying it, to be honest. Before long, his room started to look really good. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll call it a day here. I felt him suddenly looking my way. It looked like he was pretending to think about it a bit longer, and then he said, Yeah, yeah, that's enough for today. Because I had worked a lot longer than half a day, he doubled my pay. I couldn't believe it. He then said, Are you free tomorrow for a half day? I was over the moon to get another chance to earn some easy money, so I agreed straight away. I got on my bike with all my cool new looking stuff, and I told him I was looking forward to working with him tomorrow. The next morning arrived. And when I got to his place, I found the door open. I craned my head around the door and called out. He asked me to come in. He was grinning when I walked in. Ah, I have your money for you here. I'm going to leave it right here, in this envelope over here, okay? He grabbed me by my hand and led me to another room. This was weird. His whole attitude seemed different. In this room was a walk-in closet. There was a heavy-looking suitcase, one you would use for travel. This thing is just so heavy. I need you to help me move it. This is how it's going to work. I'll push from behind, and on my signal, I want you to pull as hard as you can. Is that all right? He hopped over the suitcase and went into the walk-in closet. I couldn't see him beyond all the jackets and shirts and stuff he had hanging up in there. After a while, Mr. Tanaka shouted, Pull! As per his instruction, I pulled the suitcase as hard as I could. It weighed so much. What the hell did he have in there? I wondered. It must have weighed about 60 kilos. It was moving little by little, dragging slowly across the wooden floor. There was a clattering sound, and suddenly the suitcase felt incredibly light. Mr. Tanaka! 
I called out, over and over, but there was no response. What the hell was this? Some kind of game he was playing? I didn't understand. There was still that rattling, clattering sound, but it had gradually quietened. Ten seconds or so passed. I couldn't take it anymore. I pushed the shirts and jackets aside, and I'll never forget what I saw. I saw Mr. Tanaka in the closet, hanging from his neck. He must have been either sitting or crouching on the suitcase I had pulled away. He was hanging, suspended, by a rope attached to the clothes rail in there. I ran over to help. I tried my best to pull the rope from around his neck, but it wouldn't budge. My mind raced with panicky, disjointed thoughts. Then one clear one came to me. I need something sharp to cut the rope. Mr. Tanaka wasn't moving. This was really bad. The rope was way too thick for scissors to be of any help. I had no choice but to try and get a neighbour to help. Shortly after, the police and ambulance services arrived. I was interviewed by the police at the scene. My parents travelled up. When they arrived, I remember I just broke down and I bawled my eyes out. Mr. Tanaka was taken away in an ambulance. He lived through the night, but passed away in the morning of the next day. I couldn't save him in time. The least I could do for him was to finish the cleaning. I thought that it would help me too to do that. It was just so much to process. I made sure his apartment looked good though. I had some strange compulsion to finish his final request. I went to take my payment and inside the envelope was a note as well as the money he had promised me. The note revealed that he had been laid off. His company had been looking to make cutbacks. Shortly after, he found out his wife had been cheating on him with another man. His debts and his loans seemed insurmountable to him, which is why he decided to end things. At the end of his note, he apologized to me for all the trouble he had caused me. He explained how he needed assistance to go through with it, and the cleaning job was just a ruse to get me to help. I showed this note to the police, and it put me in the clear. Police even let me keep the money. About a week went by, and Mr. Tanaka's sister got in touch. He had long been estranged from her. She revealed a certain truth that hasn't sat well with me. I wish she didn't tell me. Mr. Tanaka was a believer in a certain dangerous religion. Almost a cult-like religion. In that religion, the act of taking one's life is considered a terrible sin and is prohibited. If you did that, then you would be condemned to hell for all eternity. So, he couldn't take his own life. And that's why he needed me. I was given 100,000 yen, $900, from his family and his estate for all the trouble he had caused me. According to Mr. Tanaka's interpretation, am I now a murderer? I wonder if I'll go to hell for killing someone for 115,000 yen, just over a thousand dollars. Share this story if you feel compelled to, and thanks for listening. This happened when I was 25. I'm a female, and I had been dating a guy for about a year. Things were going great, so he asked me to meet his parents. He invited me to have dinner at their family home. It was at his parents' house where something unimaginable happened. My boyfriend was from the countryside, and his family still lives there. From where I lived, it took about three hours to get there. When I finally got to meet them, my boyfriend's attitude towards me changed dramatically. It really surprised me. He was usually quite the gentleman, but in front of his parents he addressed me with such terms as you and oi. It was downright rude. He'd shout at me using these words, like he was commanding me or something. He had never treated me like this before, but since I was at his parents' home, I just put up with it and gave him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, what else could I have done? I didn't want to make a scene and embarrass him. 
I could see where he got it from. His dad was throwing his weight around and bossing everyone around. His father shouted some command at his mum when she was doing something not quite to his liking, and it was pretty harsh. I looked over at her, and she just kept her head down and did as she was told, like this was totally normal. His family were giving off some seriously suspicious vibes. I was starting to really regret coming. It was so awkward and intimidating. At dinner, his father stared at me and said, When you get married, you will live here. It caught me off guard. It wasn't a question. It wasn't a joke. It was a demand. I just focused on cutting up my food. and I was waiting for my boyfriend to speak up for me, but he never did. So eventually I said, Well, I haven't made any decisions about that yet. His dad glared at me. He looked so angry and he said, If you marry my son, you will live here, got it? He shouted at me, a guest. I stared at my boyfriend. He must have felt my eyes pleading with him for some sort of help or defense, but he was just as silent as his mother. It killed me when he looked at his father and just nodded. More to the point, my boyfriend had never mentioned marriage to me before, so I was totally shocked by this. And to be honest, our relationship had its rocky moments. They started speaking of specific dates for a wedding. The pressure was intensifying. Later, after dinner, when I was alone with my boyfriend, I said, Hey, I feel a bit sick. I want to go home. Something isn't quite right. He didn't say a thing, so I decided to start gathering up my belongings to head home by myself. Just as I turned to leave, he grabbed me by the arm and said, Are you running away? He had totally changed. It was like I didn't know him at all. He forced me back into his childhood bedroom. He overpowered me. He shut the door on me and locked it. I beat on the door and screamed for someone to let me out. I was making so much noise there was no way that no one in that house wouldn't have heard me. Things got worse when I realized that I'd left my phone on charge downstairs. I couldn't do anything. I was literally a prisoner. After a while, the door unlocked and my psycho boyfriend's mum entered the room. I was pleased to see her. I thought she had come to my aid, but my hopes were dashed instantly when she handed me some papers. Sign this. It was a marriage certificate. If you do, you can go, she said in a monotone voice. It was the real deal. I won't sign that. I'll never marry him. You think you can escape, do you? Go on. Try your best. She asked me to sign it again, and I told her where to go. She got up and walked out of the room and locked it again. I needed to stay calm. I was terrified, sure, but I needed to keep my composure if I had a chance of getting out. I decided to wait until it was the dead of night. I turned off all the lights in the room, and I kept as still as possible. Before shutting off the lights, I figured the window would be my best and only option for escape. I would just have to deal with getting an injury if it happened. I opened the window and managed to climb down onto the porch roof silently. It was amazing. I walked the whole night through to reach the train station, fearing for my safety, looking over my shoulder for that crazy mother and father. Days and weeks passed after this incident. I got email after email from my boyfriend. You think that's the last of this? You really think you can get away? We will not forgive this. Stuff like that. Because I was living on my own at the time, I was too terrified to go back to my apartment alone. I asked friends and f I asked friends and relatives to let me stay with them. Pleaded, in fact. One friend, who lived quite far away from where I met my boyfriend, allowed me to stay with them, and I felt safer. With the help of a lawyer and a support group, I achieved what he told me was impossible. I escaped from him and his family. I hear from friends and neighbors from my old life. They say that they have seen him hanging around my former apartment and my old hangouts. Even though I live miles and miles away from him now, I'm still worried he will find me or find a way to hurt my family.
I wrote a series of stories based on my career as a tow truck driver. You can find them online. This isn't one of my stories though. And I'm really glad it isn't to be perfectly honest. It's one of my buddy's stories. He worked for me and he had a long career as a tow truck driver. This story takes place about 15 or 16 years ago. Maybe a little more, a little less. What happened was infamous. It was all over the local news. It started off innocuously enough. A simple job for people in our line of work. It was just a car which had been parked in the car park of a residential area. The windshield stuffed with illegal parking tickets and threats of impending impound. Residents' complaints about the vehicle was constant. The police even got involved, and eventually my friend was called to take the car away. Since no one came forward or reacted to the threat of removal, my friend requested police assistance, you know, just in case. Things tend to get a bit more serious in people's minds when they see a tow truck as opposed to a bunch of tickets, and it can go bad quite quickly. My friend wasn't too worried because he was a veteran of this kind of work. I told him when the call came in that he might be better off taking the flatbed truck because of the length of time that the vehicle had been there. He was already thinking the same as me. So he arrived at the building and noticed the car instantly. He positioned the truck and hopped off to make an inspection. Standard process. Seemed like a routine job, he said, until he noticed the trunk. There was something wrong with the trunk. He was grateful to have the police on hand because the trunk appeared to be welded shut. It could still be towed since we had the tools to access the driver's side door. That's never an issue, but what was the story with the trunk? The policeman on scene wanted it open. He said that if we attempted to open it, perhaps the owner of the car would come running out and then the cop could charge him. My friend tried with his tools, but to no avail. At this point, a few people from the residential area had gathered to look. My friend chose to use a winch to try and lift the trunk open. The car lifted off the ground, and when it came back down, some black liquid splashed onto the car park's floor, beneath the car. He said it appeared to have come from the trunk, and it stank. The small crowd stepped back without being asked to. My friend did the right thing and refused to tow it at this point until the police had invited forensics to take a look. When all the relevant people were present, they confirmed that the odor could be something sinister. An authorization was given to rip the trunk open. With the help of the police, my friend did as he was asked. The trunk came open. What followed was an acrid cloud of flies. They stepped forward to see what was in the trunk, and my friend, said that he saw a liquefied human skeleton. The stench, he said, was indescribable. He said he threw up almost instantly. He called me for moral support, but I had worked the night before, and I was sleeping. Man, did he curse me the next day for that. You see some very weird things in this line of work, sometimes supernatural, and sometimes very explainable. But to me, the truth is always stranger than fiction. This is where the story ends, and that's as much as I could translate, but I wasn't really satisfied with this, so I wanted to find out a little bit more. So I did a little digging of my own, and found an article which may correlate to the time in question. There will be a link to this article in the description, in English of course. A woman's body was found Monday in the trunk of a car in a parking lot in Tama, western Tokyo, the Metropolitan Police said. The police believe the woman is 59-year-old owner of a bar in Kawasaki. The car was owned by the woman, they added. At around 9.30am, police were informed that a foul odour was coming from the car, which had been there since Tuesday. In Woods in Kanagawa Prefecture on Thursday, police found the body of a 70-year-old man who was living with the bar owner. They said that they are looking into whether the two deaths are linked. The woman had been missing since the 16th of October, and her relatives had asked the police to investigate her whereabouts.
This happened when I was working part-time in a hotel. I was a student at the time. The hotel had been there since before I was born. It was a very pretty historic building. With such a historic building came customary tasks for the new staff. There was a long and established test of courage, or dare, if you will. So, wanting to fit in, I accepted the challenge. It seemed simple enough. I had to walk by myself at midnight up to the eighth floor and do a full lap through the corridors, collecting the customer's breakfast order cards. You know those cards that you tick and you hang outside your door? They're pretty old school, but like I said, the hotel was ancient. I wasn't worried, so I accepted the challenge. Just as it was approaching midnight, the staff were telling me stories of horror on the eighth floor. When you're up there, you can hear footsteps following you around. You turn around, expecting to see someone staring at you. You can't see anyone, but you know something's there. Then you turn back around, and look down, and you see a child in front of you. No, it's not a child, but it's a man, covered in blood, with no legs. They've been cut off. I knew that this was nothing but an urban legend, but in the midnight hour of this historic hotel, I started to believe that anything could be possible. I set off up the stairs on my solo venture. I wasn't allowed to use the elevator, I had to take the stairs. It was a very quiet and spooky walk. As I walked, I was very aware that my back was exposed. I kept checking over my shoulder. I upped my pace, I wanted to get it over with. I went up to the fourth and fifth floor, and each time I rounded the corridor's innermost corner, I felt a chill. There weren't any air conditioners nearby though. I got to the sixth floor and felt the same chill, but this time stronger. And by the time I arrived on the seventh floor, I nearly had an anxiety attack. I had to keep going. I didn't want to lose my job. I imagined how much they would laugh at me. I bet they were watching me on the CCTV cameras too. As I reached the top of the stairs, I felt a very disturbing energy. I really didn't like it on this floor. I felt like... I felt like the eyes of some unseen predator were on me. Again, it was colder than the previous floors. I was passing the rooms, but suddenly stopped, still in front of a room. I didn't know why. It was as if my legs disobeyed me. I could hear a voice. A woman was in there, talking. Was she on the phone? I didn't want to eavesdrop, but I couldn't move. The woman started screaming at someone in there. Her voice was full of pain and anger. It was the room in the innermost corner of the eighth floor. Suddenly, I was able to move again, and those chills disappeared. I went around the rest of the floor, got in the elevator, and headed back to the staff room where I told my colleagues about my experience. Before I could even mention the room on the eighth floor, someone asked, Did you sense anything? Odd, near the room on the corner. I said that I did, and they told me what happened there. Apparently, on the eighth floor, in the very room I had stopped in front of, a female guest took her own life. Since so many guests complained about the temperature and strange goings on in that room, it is no longer rented to customers. They explained that they made up that other story to see if I would notice the room in the corner by myself. I said that I was glad that the dare was over and I didn't chicken out halfway. No one smiled and one of my colleagues held out his hand and offered me the master key. The dare's not over. I said that there was no way I was going back up there. If you heard someone in that room, we have to go check it out. Someone might be in there. You want to work in the hotel business, this is part of it. Come on. A couple of us got in the elevator and headed back to the 8th floor again. I was dreading it. We approached the door. I put the key in the lock and unlocked it. I felt for sure I was about to see someone in there. But the room was untouched. I know that I heard a voice in there. We headed back down to the staff room. We spoke about what happened for a while. And then I was told about the second part of my dare. I really hated it. I was deemed to have the sixth sense, and they wanted to put it to further test. I was told about a mountain just behind the hotel. There was a Tori gate there. A kind of huge gate. They're common in Japan. The Tori was erected to create a sense of peace because in days long gone by, that mountain's plateau was used as a beheading site. I was to go up there and bring back something they had left by the Tori. They didn't tell me what I was retrieving, they just said I had to do it. I was still terrified by the hotel dare, I wasn't ready for this. They said that they'd let me do the dare another night. Several days later, and I am on the night shift as usual, 
my fellow employees approached me, and at around 2am I knew it was time to make my solo trip through the mountains. Heading up that mountain road in the dark with only a weak flashlight and the moonlight to guide me was horrible. I could hear the trees swaying and the sound of bugs, frogs, etc. I was thinking about what they could have hidden up there. What type of thing would I have to bring back? I was walking for about 10 minutes now, and for some reason the sounds of nature were calming me. I didn't feel frightened anymore. I felt as if I was in a state of acceptance. I arrived at the open plateau, and there stood the looming Tori before me. I saw the thing I was supposed to bring back. I grabbed it straight away. I thought that it was in very poor taste. Before me was a small set of steps, and above it, hanging from the Tori, was a rope with a noose. It looked as if it was an invitation for me. I was already mentally writing my resignation letter in my head as I untied the noose. I made it back to the staff room, determined to show them that their little dares had become tiresome. I presented the rope, and they all looked shocked. They said that they had just left a note there, stuck to the back side of the Tory. I didn't know what to believe. Were they pranking me on both occasions, or was there something more sinister at work? Thankfully, I didn't have to find out as I left the hotel soon after. I worked part-time at a DVD rental store. My boss made a corner of the shop devoted to the top-ranked rentals of the week so customers could see what's popular. I hadn't been working there long before I came across a DVD which really interested me. I'd like to keep the title secret for reasons you'll find out shortly. Even though it wasn't a very famous or critically acclaimed title, it was constantly being rented. Hey, I said to my colleague, have you seen this film? Nah, I haven't. Why? It's getting rented all the time. It's really popular. I said as I showed him the jacket cover. What, that? Weird. We only have one copy, so how did it get in the best ranking list? Wonder if the boss knows. Huh, <laughs> maybe it's a masterpiece. We should check it out. We'll call my friend R. As R's apartment was not too far from my university. I stop by and drink with him occasionally after studying. Although R is a bit older than me, we get on well and we have similar interests. So one day, when it was hot and humid, I shot him a text. My body demanded beer. Hey man, I got no classes tomorrow. Let's get some drinks. Is it cool if I stay over? Great. I need, to, I need some beers, man. This heat is killing me. Come over. <laughs> Let's watch that weird movie too. When work was finished, we went to a bar. Then, when we were sufficiently buzzed, we headed to R's apartment to watch the movie. The main protagonist of the film was a man who worked in an oil refinery, and his plans to get married. He was a clumsy character. That was the film. This movie sucks, R said. Let's turn it off and get some sleep. The moment he aimed his remote at the TV, the image on the screen changed. Uh, this happened at the 51st minute of the video if anybody's interested. R slowly put the remote down on the table. Someone's dubbed something over one of our films, I said. Hey, this, this looks like it's Japan, right? R said while we watched. Hang on, that's around here. That's this neighborhood, he shouted. I noticed it too. On the screen was a road I knew on the outskirts of town. It looked like it was filmed out of a car driving down the highway on 8mm film or something like that. After a while, the car stopped on the side of the road and the driver slash cameraman got out and walked through a grove of trees to a run-down abandoned building. Weeds and trees grew at their own will. The cameraman pushed through them and continued walking. It went on for a few minutes like this. Then he entered a house. An old refrigerator came into frame. There was no sound. He reached for the handle. It opened 
the old refrigerator. Inside is the remains of a body. It was in a late stage of decomposition. It was the embodiment of horror. That was on my friend's TV screen. Oh, I'm gonna be sick, I cried. It froze on that disgusting image, and after about five minutes or so, he went back to the original film. Turn it off. Man, that's too real. R was saying. R seemed to think that it was part of the movie. I wanted to hand it into the police. But the next day, R showed the store owner, and he also thought it was part of the movie. Even now, that movie is on the shelf of our rental store. And the weirdest thing is, we've never received a complaint about it. It's being rented constantly. Since R doesn't believe it's real, he has offered to take me to the location on the outside of our town to see if we can find the house. But I know that wasn't part of the movie. By the way, the video shop I work in is in Furukawa in Miyagi. This happened when I was at high school. I belonged to a basketball club. I developed a huge crush on a senior at the club. We ended up getting very close. We'd often meet in private. One day, off from school, he called me, asking if I wanted to come over and hang out. Of course, I was over the moon to be invited to his home. So I asked him for the address straight away. Uh, I'm actually outside your house, so why don't you come out and I'll just take you there. I went outside as quickly as I could. There was a car waiting outside our family home. There was some weird guy I hadn't seen before, sat with my crush in the car. I got in the car and he spun around and said to me, let's go have some fun. And with that, we pulled away. I wondered where the hell we were going or what we were going to do as the car rumbled through the countryside roads. The car suddenly stopped and my crush blurted out. Ah, oh, I have something I really have to do. I'll be back as soon as I can. And then he left me. Oh my god, why are you leaving now? I thought. But I trusted him to be right back, just as he said. I felt lost and confused, but I just tried to enjoy the drive. After a while, the car stopped and we arrived at a house. I knew it wasn't my crushes, as the nameplate outside was different. The guy in the car then asked, Why don't we, uh go in and have a drink while we wait. I felt obliged to accept this offer, since he was friends with my crush, and I didn't want to look bad. When we got inside, something was wrong. I was getting a very bad vibe. Loads of my new acquaintances' friends were sat around a table. It really freaked me out. Why was I brought here? I wondered. The people there were being nice to me there. Before long, night came. I had mentioned a few times my desire to go home before it got too late, yet no one batted an eyelid to this request. I really started to worry now, so I kept saying, I want to go home soon. I had an incoming call from my mum. One of the guys there went crazy at me when I excused myself to answer it. He snatched the phone out of my hand. This was no longer a friendly or normal situation. The man who took my phone told me I wouldn't be going anywhere. I judged the situation as best I could and came to the conclusion that I had been sold by my crush to these strange men. Perhaps they were small time Yakuza or something. It seemed as if I would be spending the night here, possibly longer. My heart ached. I just wanted to see my parents again. It's a feeling I wouldn't wish on my worst enemies. Before I knew it, I was bawling my eyes out. They put me in another room and told me to sleep. I tried to think on my feet. I opened the door as quietly as I could. I listened to the men's conversations. It went something like this. Will we get a good price for her from them? The poor thing. It's fine. 
I couldn't believe I was listening to them discussing my future. I pretended to sleep in the bed. I couldn't do anything else. I resigned myself to my fate. I had come to terms with the idea that I wouldn't see my parents or friends ever again. I tried to prepare myself psychologically for whatever would happen next. After a sleepless night, I saw the early light of morning. I needed the bathroom, so I opened the bedroom door and went in search. My heart was pounding. On the way, I bumped into one of those men. I don't want to do this, but if you try to escape or go somewhere I can't see you, then uh, he trailed off. I won't try and escape, I whimpered. I apologized from the bottom of my heart to my parents. My life in abduction went on this way for about a week, until one night I was forcibly woken from my sleep, dragged out to a car so violently by the man who picked me up originally. I was pushed in, the engine started, and we pulled away. I had no idea where we were heading. To a buyer, I guessed. It was so hard for the last days and nights to escape reality. I couldn't even comfort myself with family memories as it was just too painful. I felt as if I was losing my mind. I was ready to die. I couldn't physically cry anymore. I was absent-mindedly gazing out of the passenger side window when I noticed familiar things from my neighborhood. Then the car pulled to a stop in front of my house. Go, the man said. I got out and he pulled away into the night. He must have felt some sympathy for me, or his conscience kicked in. To this day, I have no idea what caused his change of heart. I was dumbstruck to be returning home so safely. I went inside my family home, a place I thought only moments ago I would never see again. My mother rushed downstairs. She must have heard me come in. She was so angry. Because I was young and stupid, I thought that telling her about my abduction would get me into more trouble or make her worry, so I just told her I'd been staying with a friend. She screamed at me for not getting in touch with her at least once during that last week. My mother still doesn't know what happened, and it's ten years later. When I went back to school, I couldn't find a trace of that senior, my crush who had gotten me into that mess. He must have left town before handing me over to those guys. I hope he can't sleep at night. I hope he's tormented and tortured by his guilt. It was a truly terrifying event, but I'm lucky to say that I live very well these days, and I live happily. Last winter, my girlfriend and I had a huge argument while we were driving home late night in the mountainside. She kicked me out of the car and left me there. I thought that she'd come back soon, but she didn't. And to top it off, I realized I left my phone in her car. It was the dead of night, not a single car passed by. So the only option I had was to walk home. I was so annoyed. As I knew where I was on the mountainside, I decided to use a shortcut instead of the road my girlfriend and I drove up on. The grass was long on this road, but I could tell that a car had driven down here recently. Some of the grass was flat. This shortcut probably doesn't get used so much, so I found it a bit strange. It was a hard walk. I was cold and frightened. I wanted to quit. It was horrible. It was late at night and the hillside was so dark, I couldn't really see where I was walking. Then I saw a light. A small family car was approaching. It was behind me, its bright light shining past me. The car's headlights were warm on my back. Was it running out of gas? Well, whatever. For the time being, I thought I'd at least ask to borrow their phone. I stepped into the middle of the grass road and called out, um, excuse me. I regretted this idea almost instantly. 
Without thought, I had plunged myself into potential danger. I had no idea who was in the car, or what they were doing in the mountain woods so late at night. What's wrong? A woman's voice called out from the car. I explained the situation, and I asked if I could borrow her phone. We're out of the service area, she replied very calmly. With that said, I decided that I wanted to get the hell away from her. Well, uh, I better get going then, I said while I turned to leave. Please help me. By saying these few words, it ensured my escape was impossible. Help me dig a hole. If you help me, just for a moment, after we're done, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. As she said this, her right hand was idly making scooping gestures above her head, as if to cover it. Swinging her hand in that pendulum style made me wonder if I were to refuse, what might happen? I frantically dug a hole with the shovel she supplied. While I was digging, the woman watched and talked to me. I can't remember most of the conversation. Doesn't make any difference now. She seemed to like talking. She was asking me all kinds of questions about myself. I thought it would be a bad idea to give her the correct answers, so I just made them up as I went along. Finally, I finished digging the hole. She went to her car and brought back a bag. I thought I was about to see a corpse, but I was wrong. The bag was overflowing with hair. Too much hair for one person. Uh, are you a hairdresser? I asked nervously. There was no reply, just silence. It was terrifying. She brought lots of items from the car and threw them into the hole that I had dug. There were children's toys, clothes, etc. The last item was a cooler. I was terrified that there might be something in there. A child. My heart started pounding in my chest. By the end of it all, I didn't know what to think. She gave me a ride home, as promised, and it was finished. I began to forget about the incident over time, but this year, I found a paper bag in front of my house. I looked inside, and it was full of hair. I remembered the incident on the mountain and wondered if this could be a coincidence. Surely, surely not. It had to be related. I decided to tell my good friend about the situation, and my story certainly sparked his curiosity. Well, let's go there and dig up what you two buried, he asked. To be honest, I want nothing to do with those bags of hair, I replied. But he said, why don't you just tell me where the place is then and I'll go do it myself. And he kept asking and talking about it at work, again and again. It got to the point where I ended up going with him. I didn't want to, though, but I felt he shouldn't go alone. One day after work, we headed towards the mountains, and he decided to invite another work friend, too. Us three drove up the mountain road. There was a chain sectioning off the grass road I had walked down, and my friend got out of the car and unhooked it. The grass had grown a lot since last year. It bent beneath the wheels of the car. It was like we were surfing. I couldn't quite remember where the hole was, since it had overgrown now. I thought, because of this, my friends would just give up searching for the hole. Nope. So I thought I'd just say, Oh, here's the hole, in the hope of us digging there, finding nothing, and then we would all go home and it would all be over. But then it occurred to me that anyone would be able to notice the difference between a place that had been dug up. The grass would obviously be shorter, and the soil would probably be a different color too. Here it is, my friend said with glee. Park up, shine the headlights in this direction. Let's dig it up, fast, my friend shouted. I wanted to go home quickly, so I didn't protest. I just helped them. With us three men digging, we were able to unearth the things that the woman had thrown away quite quickly. 
When I helped her bury all that stuff from her car, it was dark and I couldn't see it very well. There were a lot more things than I could remember in the hole. And there was the thing I was the most worried about. The cooler box. My friend wrenched it open. Black water splashed out. My friend dropped it and all the black water sloshed out into the grass. What the hell, my friend said. I was expecting a body, my friend's friend said. This isn't a novel, this is reality, I told him. We filled in the hole and went back down the mountain. On the way back, my friend suddenly started to scream and shout about his hand. He said it felt as if his hand was burning. When he opened the cooler, that black water splashed on his hand. We rushed him to the closest hospital. We got his hand examined and the doctor told us that he had suffered a corrosive burn. He got treated for it and we were all relieved. But in the end, I still don't have the answer of why those things were buried out there in the mountains. The mystery remains a mystery. Nothing was resolved. I guess that's the end of it. I hope so. This terrible thing happened about 15 years ago. I was 20 years old and living alone. I came home from work, checked the post as I usually do, and found a sealed letter. It was a blank envelope. Inside, there were two tickets to a concert and a letter. A love letter. The writer's feelings for me were quite clear. It went something like this. Let's meet at the concert. I'll keep my identity hidden until we meet. I'm sure you'll be surprised. I'm someone you know. I had a boyfriend at the time, and I had no idea who wrote that. I thought for a moment that I won a competition or something. I remembered that I entered one. But then I remembered that I had entered that competition only this morning, so there's no way that the tickets could be in my letterbox by the evening. Something wasn't right, so I didn't go to the concert. I thought that if it truly is someone that I know, as soon as they reveal themselves to me, then I'd apologize. I'm sure if they are a decent and kind person, they'd understand my caution. The day after the concert, I found a threatening looking letter stuffed into my letterbox. Why didn't you come? You idiot! Don't pretend like you aren't interested. This is BS. The first letter was gentlemanly in a sense, but this was the complete opposite. Back then, mobile phones weren't so common. As soon as I returned home from work, the moment I closed my front door, my home phone rang. I picked it up, and the other party hung up. This happened often. I didn't get a call or letter every single day. It was irregular. I would get one a week, and then the next week I'd get three or four. This kind of thing went on for about three months. It was so creepy that I ended up moving away. Finally, peace. Well, that's what I thought until one month after I moved into a new place, the same thing started again. I didn't get a call this time, but I found another blank envelope in my letterbox. There was no sender's address or name, so it must have been posted by hand. When I saw this, it was clear to me that I had a stalker, and the stalker had found my new home. I was really scared. I took the letter to the police station and spoke to an officer. Ignoring the other party is the most effective thing you can do. As soon as he realizes that he's being ignored, he will stop. This advice doesn't solve anything, I thought. Then the officer said, Look, women who live alone often get lonely, right? And sometimes single ladies have a tendency to allow harmless antics to get blown out of proportion. Mm hmm? He laughed and thought I was delusional. Back in those days, the word stalker wasn't widely recognized in Japan. The laws in place aren't what they are today. I felt so sad that he didn't try to help me. He didn't back me up. It was like he took the stalker's side. I'll just move again, I thought. But around that time, my boyfriend and I were talking about marriage. So I moved back to my parents' house while we talked it over. 
My parents' home was in the same prefecture, but it was way out into the sticks, so commuting to work was a real pain. But I thought, eh, at least I'd be rid of the stalker. I was wrong. Carnage and bloodshed were right around the corner for me. I finished work and headed towards the train station. On the way, a man stood blocking my way. When I tried to go one way, he stood in that way, and when I tried to go the other, he blocked me again. He towered over me. He was peering down at me. His jaw hung open, and he was breathing through his mouth. It's him. It's my stalker, I thought. But I didn't recognize him. Why didn't you come? He muttered. For a moment, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, and then suddenly I remembered. The tickets. I knew he wanted an answer, but I couldn't say a word. It was rush hour. People were all around us. I wasn't terrified, but I was scared. It was risky. So I said in quite a loud voice, for the benefit of those around, Excuse me, please let me pass. As I said this, people all around looked in our direction. But then my stalker did something unexpected. He turned and ran into the busy street. Right before my eyes, he was hit by a car. You may think this is quite cold-hearted, but I just thought as I rode the train home, that is not my fault. I was kind of happy that the harassment might be all over. In case you're wondering, he lived. However, one of the stalker's colleagues saw this all unfold. This guy said that it looked as if we were having a lover's quarrel. And when the stalker got hit by the car, he said that I pretended not to notice, feigned ignorance, and just walked off. This rumor was spread around by the stalker's co-worker. Every year my company and other companies in the same line of work have a sports day for a bit of friendly competition. I remember talking to a few people, but there were so many people I can't remember who I spoke to very well. Apparently, this is how I met my stalker. I'm usually really good at remembering faces, but I didn't recognize him. I found out that he came to my company a few times a week. I work in the personnel department, hidden away in a small office, so I don't often see people other than the ones I immediately work with. Yet the rumors about me grew. They said that we often met at work. Of course, I denied all these false allegations and stated the fact that I was the victim of stalking but I wasn't convinced that anyone believed me. Another shock was in store for me. I was dumped. Although my boyfriend and I weren't officially engaged, we had set up a date for me to be introduced to his parents in his hometown. At that point, we would officially announce our plans to engage. The rumors had reached their ears before I had arrived. As I said before, the suffering caused by stalkers wasn't well documented in Japan. They said to me when I met them, You must have given this guy some sign that he had a chance with you. Somehow, you must have given him the wrong idea. You caused his actions. Are you sure there wasn't anything going on between you two? With this doubt and distrust imposed upon me, my boyfriend was persuaded by his parents to end our relationship. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to escape. I wanted a fresh start. So I resigned from my job as well. It has been over 20 years since this has happened, and the wounds caused by the stalker still feel fresh. My desire to work hard at the assumption that I would eventually get married and spend my life with a husband has died. I came to the conclusion that I would end up alone. So far I'm right. time ago. My dad was seeing another woman behind my mum's back. A few years later, he decided to break it off with his mistress. This caused her to become mentally unstable. My sisters and I would occasionally see her stood on the road near our school, acting strange. She frightened us. My sisters were able to ignore her with ease, but I somehow felt sorry for her. She spoke to me 
occasionally. And when my sisters weren't there, I would always reply. After a while, she would say things like, You're such a good girl. You're the best out of your sisters. One day, to my surprise, she gave me a Jenny doll. I was overjoyed. Since I am the youngest of my siblings, I would always get their hand-me-downs. I never had something new, something of my very own. Now this wasn't some old tattered doll, no. This was a brand new Jenny doll, just for me. I didn't want my sisters to get their hands on my new doll and take her for their own. Furthermore, I was sure that they would tell on me and mum and dad would take Jenny away. I decided not to tell them about the doll. But because my father's mistress was mentally unstable, she didn't really care what kind of trouble she caused me. She became obsessive. She tried to give me a huge amount of Jenny products. A hair salon, a playhouse, seven more Jenny dolls. Every day she would be waiting for me on the way to school. It was all too much and her behavior scared me. So I began to avoid her. I changed my route. After a while she stopped waiting for me on the way to school. And eventually, I went back to walking my usual route to school again. I was happy. But one morning, I saw her again. I didn't feel the usual kindness she had projected before. Something had changed. She was very calm and still. Totally the opposite of how she had been before. Her face was pale, and her smile was now thin. I couldn't really see much of her face as it was hidden beneath the brim of her big hat and sunglasses. She was carrying two huge overnight bags by her side. In one of the bags, a box was poking out, somewhat intentionally. Immediately I recognized the box's shape. I was sure that it was a Jenny doll box. I have to go away. I'm going far away. Please accept this as a parting gift, she said as she offered the box to me. It was a Jenny doll, one that I hadn't seen before. It was a Jenny with long black hair. I hurried along to school. I was so eager to show everyone my rare new Jenny. Honestly, I couldn't wait to start boasting. Some horrid boy snatched the box from me at school. He tore it open and pulled my new rare Jenny's head off. I was mortified. Some of the girls at school managed to get Jenny back from the boy and they returned her to me. I held her head in my hands. I saw weed-like clumps of someone's black hair jutting from beneath her chin. It didn't look right. One of the girls who returned the doll pinched a clump of the hair at first, a huge, curled-up wad of hair came out, followed by long, trailing strands. We watched as the hair from Jenny's scalp slowly started to become unraveled. A crowd of children gathered round to get a closer look. Hair from her head was disappearing from the scalp as the girl tugged on the clump of hair. Someone noticed small blood clots attached to the roots of the hair. It was definitely human hair. This wasn't hair that was cut, but hair that was torn from someone's head. We all stared at the doll. Suddenly, we were all screaming in horror. I felt so scared and so bad inside, I was revolted. I began to cry. Others around me were crying too, even the boy who ripped Jenny's head off. We were inconsolable. The teachers had to cancel our following lesson. The teachers called an assembly, and we were all given a serious talk about that incident. We were reminded of the importance of not receiving gifts from strangers, and to be aware of perverts. I was made to state before my teachers and my parents, who were called in from work, I will not take things from strangers, and I will be careful of perverts. Neither my parents nor teachers would say that the pervert was my father's ex-mistress. 
It was just a word used to distance us all from my father's personal situation. To this day, whenever I see a Jenny doll, I feel sick and frightened, especially the new ones with black hair. This happened when I started living alone. Not long after, I had just moved in. I think it must have been the first week. I found out that my new apartment was in the path of an oncoming typhoon. That night I had gotten off to sleep alright, but I awoke in the middle of the night to hear the sound of wind and rain lashing my windows. It was so loud. I just couldn't get back to sleep. I was lying there in bed, thinking about nothing in particular, when I heard. It was coming from the front door. It was the doorbell. Who the hell would be ringing the doorbell of my new apartment? I asked myself. I crept downstairs and I took a look through the peephole. There was a person out there. I was freaked out, but I asked, Who is it? I could hear the fear in my voice. Hey, it's me, man. It was my friend. Literally, my best friend. He was one of the only ones who knew my address. Why didn't you just tell me you were coming over, man? It's like the middle of the night. I said through the door. I tried to get a look at him, but it was dark and he had his hat pulled down. That didn't matter because we were friends. I mean, it was a little weird, but I've known him for years. Hey, you really did well to get here in this storm, dude. I called out as I started to unlock the door. That was the moment that something dawned on me. Best friend or not, why was he out here, barely talking, and how did he make it here? I could still hear the ferocity of the typhoon against the door. Another odd thing, he didn't have a driver's license. Even if he somehow caught a bus, he would have had to walk for a long while. There were no bus stops nearby. I didn't know the area all that well, but it seemed a bit too late for buses. Besides, who turns up in the middle of the night, during a storm, unannounced? These were all red flags, and I didn't like them. What the hell was this? I brought my eye closer to the peephole. Hey, uh, bud, how did you... Get here, I asked cautiously. We fell into an awkward silence while the typhoon raged on. I brought my eye closer to the peephole. I wanted to catch a closer look at him. His skin was disturbingly pale. It reminded me of a waxwork skin. His eyes flitted back and forth, as if they were remote controlled. That wasn't my friend. I wasn't even sure that was a human. It was pretending. Whatever it was. I didn't let on that I was scared, but I was petrified. I watched that thing out there, which looked like my best friend, stand there and smile inanely, occasionally twitching at the corners of its lips. I had to get away from the door once I saw that. I went into another room and I tried my best to compose myself. I tried to think about what to do next. All the while, that friend thing repeated the same line it delivered earlier, as if it was all it knew, like it was an actor practicing its lines. Hey, it's me, man. I called my friend, the one it was impersonating. He said that it wasn't him. I knew it wasn't him, but I just had to be 100% sure. That thing was very convincing. I went upstairs and went back to bed, but sleep wouldn't come. I didn't know how long that thing stayed outside my door, but I heard it occasionally repeating its line. Hey, it's me, man. After a sleepless night, the sun rose.
This isn't my story, but one I heard from a member of my caving club. This story is distressing, but I think it serves a purpose, so please hear me out. In Iwate Prefecture, there are numerous caves. Back when this story takes place, it wasn't as touristy as it is today, so many of the caves lay unmapped and partially unexplored because internal surveys weren't often conducted. Back then, survey events were held within the caving community, and this story concerns a very large cave survey on a winter's day. Participants broke up into groups, with the more experienced members of the club trying to map and investigate the cave. There were areas which had already been mapped, and some of the caving club members grew a bit bored of measuring areas of the cave. They were just wandering around at their own pace. They were more interested in taking photos and looking for wildlife. This wasn't a good idea. I guess this is why we are told this cautionary tale when we join the club. One of the cave explorers decided to crawl down a narrow opening in the cave. The others in the club knew, based on the survey, that there was nothing but a dead end. So initially, they weren't concerned. Unfortunately, that changed quickly. We all knew he would go in, find nothing, and probably squirm his way back out, backwards, since it was incredibly narrow. But after a few minutes passed, he didn't come back out. We all gathered around and began to panic. We looked at the tiny crevasse he managed to crawl into, and then someone in the club asked aloud, Is there enough room to turn around in there? Another chimed in with what we were all thinking. Did he get stuck? There was a sober silence, which was broken by the sound of someone shuffling. He came back out of the crevasse. I cannot tell you how relieved I was to see him. Something was wrong there. He looked jaded and frightened. Not only that, he didn't come out backwards. He came out facing everyone, which we were all sure was impossible. Then he began to mumble about what had just happened in that narrow crevasse. I got to the dead end, but there was something more. There was an even narrower hole. For some reason I poked at it and discovered that the earth beneath the hole could be moved aside. After working at this for a while, I managed to get the hole wide enough to fit both my arms in there. Then, my whole body. It opened up into a reasonably wide chamber. That's how he was able to turn around. He went on. I thought that I had found an undiscovered part of the cave, and I was really excited. I shone my torch all over the cave, and, and my torchlight fell on something. A doll, I thought or maybe a mannequin. It was lying on the cave floor, backed into a corner. I had heard of seeing things in caves, you know, stalagmites which appear to look like humans, as well as odd formations of mud on the cave floor. I was aware that my eyes could play tricks on me in the dark too, but none of this accounted for the fact that this human-shaped mass was wearing glasses. So you think it was human? Someone asked. He nodded silently. The caving club left and called the police. Later, the body was identified. According to the police, it was the body of a high school student who went missing a few years ago. He entered the cave with candles and some sweets, so we can establish that he had intent to explore. But for what purpose? Some speculate it was because he wanted to commit suicide. Others say that he just wanted to explore. Perhaps it was his own little secret base. Due to this portion of the cave almost completely shut off, his body had been preserved from the elements. The only issue was muddy water from above had dripped onto the body. One strange thing was the glasses didn't have a drop of muddy water on them. If you have never been in a cave with no light source, Perhaps I can help you imagine what it's like. I've been in caves where I've turned the torch off just for a second, 
It was so dark I couldn't tell whether my eyes were open or shut. I tried to stay in the dark as long as possible. The longest I could manage was about a minute. I think the everyday, ordinary person could keep their sense of balance for about ten minutes. After that, you wouldn't know up from down. Then, the mind wanders. The things in the dark, they can tolerate it, but man can't. The sounds, the loss of direction, it all adds up. It all takes a toll. The poor high school boy must have lasted about 30 minutes or so without panic in there. I'm assuming that there was some sort of cave-in which buried the only exit. Then things would have gotten worse. When his matches got wet, or perhaps he couldn't find where he left the candles. At this point, he would have regretted his decision to enter the cave, as there would be no one to hear his whimpers or screams for help. He would be cursing himself time and time again for coming or for not bringing a torch. Maybe even, maybe even wishing he told someone where he was going. How many times did he trace his hands along the wall, looking for the exit, back and forth, back and forth? How many days did he live? What kind of hallucinations did he see? Unsure if he was awake or asleep, hallucinating or thinking straight. Hunger or thirst, one of those must have come for him towards the end but not before his mind tormented him further. Maybe he didn't even truly feel like himself towards the end. Maybe his identity faded into the darkness. How many times did he scream, scratch the walls, cry? He would have died without even realizing he was alive or dead. Staring, backed into the corner, hiding from whatever was tormenting him, his glasses resting on his nose, pointing towards the exit he could no longer find. I think this is the most terrifying and tragic death I've ever heard. this story from my grandmother. During the war, it was quite common for children to be sent from cities to families in the countryside. Sometimes this would be your own family, other times you might get sent to live with complete strangers. The hope was sending the children to these remote locations was that it would save them from airstrikes, generally remove them from the areas of conflict and give them a better lease on life. Often in the mountains, the villagers would excavate areas into the mountains to create makeshift air raid shelters. That's what my grandmother said anyway. On the outskirts of the village, in a dense mountain forest, was a cave. My grandmother heard, my grandmother heard of this cave, and she decided that it would be her air raid shelter, if the worst should happen. She spoke with her friend in the village, and she agreed to help my grandmother check out the cave and see if they needed to clear it up or make further excavations. The cave was incredibly dark and cool. It provided some respite from the heat of summer, but it needed some work to make it big enough to house more members of the village. People from the village pitched in to make this happen. A few days after work began in the cave, strange and unexplainable things began to happen in the village. The friend my grandmother had been working with vanished. She was a young woman, and she really didn't have any reason to run from the village. It was very distressing for my grandmother, especially since my grandmother said she managed to disappear within the cave. They entered together, but only my grandmother came out of the cave. No one in the village had seen the young woman. It was only a small mountain village, so she was sure that someone would have noticed her leaving. The village was full of older men and women. There were single women, wives and children. 
all able-bodied males were sent off to the war, so everyone knew everyone, and they were all looking out for one another. No one could think of a reason she would have to leave. It felt very weird, but they had to keep working in the cave. Not long after, the second person disappeared. She was older than my grandmother's friend. Then the third disappeared, also a woman. When the third went missing, talk of going to work in the cave in the woods dwindled away. Some people in the village believed that the people who entered the cave were laying a curse of some description upon themselves. That fact wasn't true for my grandmother, though. The cave was considered a bad omen, and the villagers didn't go near it. I asked my grandmother about it some more, and she said she used to hear stories about the cave when she was younger. Something about men trying to hunt something which lived in there, and how it was one with the shadows. Some kind of apex predator. There is a lot of missing people stories in the mountains, even to this day. It just makes me wonder what's lurking out there in these remote areas. She said that after the war, people didn't like to go near the cave in the woods, even during the daytime, especially women. Shortly after the war, all the evacuees pulled from the villages, so my grandmother has no idea if the cave is still there to this day, or if the missing people ever returned. There is an abandoned hospital in Atsugi, Kanagawa Prefecture. This story takes place in that building. The abandoned hospital is located next to the highway, about 20 minutes away from Hon Atsugi Station. The hospital is huge. It has a massive parking lot, and I think it's about 10 floors tall. It's since become an urban exploration spot. At night, you can see torchlight coming from inside the hospital. Brave people looking for scares. The hospital is in complete ruins. There are pictures painted on the walls, as well as a lot of graffiti. I live close by the hospital, and I happen to pass it every day. I cannot stand scary stories or anything horror-related, so I was never interested in the hospital. I never would have thought that I would set foot in that place. Well, that was until my dog got off his lead and ran in there. To be honest, when this happened, I thought that my dog would just come running back straight away. When I called him, I wasn't really that worried. He's ran off before, in fields and in the woods, and he always comes back. On the other hand, I was certain that there was broken glass and shards of metal in there. Not to mention how close it is to the road, I was worried that my dog could dash out into the road and get hit by a car. Luckily, I always carry a torch when I take my dog for a walk, so I turned it on and headed in to search for my dog. It was nice and cool in the ward. This story takes place in summer, by the way. Inside there was garbage and papers everywhere. Most of the desks and cabinets which would have been used when the hospital was operational were smashed and broken. I heard my dog barking He's in here for sure, I thought. It sounded like his barks were coming from down below. I made my way down the long hallway, following the sound of my dog's barks. They had started to sound more like whines. I was getting worried now, so I stepped up the pace. I reached the staircase and went down it. I could still hear him whining down there. I didn't want to go down there. This cold, derelict hospital was seriously scaring me. I didn't want to go any further, but I had to. There was no way I was leaving my dog down there. I went down the stairs step by step, like a little kid might. I could hear my footsteps echoing around the building. I reached the turning landing on the stairs, heading towards the basement. The light from my flashlight landed on a figure. It stood there before me. I nearly dropped the flashlight, but then I realized that I was looking at my own reflection 
in a mirror. My heart felt like it was sinking. I was now more terrified than I had ever been before. There was something so disturbing in that hospital. It was as if the atmosphere was swallowing me. When I got off the stairs, there was another long hallway. I was shining my flashlight into the darkness and I could hear that my dog was close by. I was whispering as loud as I could to my dog, come here, come on. I didn't know why I was whispering. I was almost certain that I was the only person in there. I just felt like I shouldn't make loud noises in this place. It was just so strange in there. I didn't even feel like it was part of the real world at the time. I'm not even sure if that makes sense. No matter how many times I called my dog, he didn't come. I just heard him barking somewhere down there at the end of the hall. If he wasn't going to come to me, then I thought that I would have no other choice but to physically pick him up and carry him out. I tiptoed as silently as I could towards my dog, but the second I approached him, with my arms outstretched, he made a whining sound and ran for it. It was as if he was spooked by something. He scampered past me. I pointed my flashlight in the direction of the area my dog had stopped and barked at. It looked like nothing but a white wall. I was wrong there. It was a pair of double doors. You've seen them before, in the movies, the big doors that open outwards and don't have door handles. I heard a jolting, creaking sound of a door opening. It seemed as if something was slowly opening the doors before me. My body started to shake. I needed to get the hell out of there. I took one look back over my shoulder as I ran towards the stairs. I wouldn't do that again. I couldn't look back. I didn't want to lay eyes on whomever was down there. I saw the entrance doors up ahead and I clattered into them with all my might, but I didn't burst through them. I felt as if someone had grabbed my ponytail at the last second and yanked me back as if they were preventing me from leaving. It yanked me with so much force that it nearly knocked me off my feet. I think I screamed, let go, or something panicked. After about a second, I felt release and I hit the cold stone floor of the hospital lobby. I scrabbled to my feet and threw tears and more whines than my dog admitted. I was finally out of the abandoned hospital. For a moment back there, I thought that I would never see the light of day again. I was so worried about my dog for so long, despite my fear, I wandered around the outskirts of the hospital calling his name. I was completely distraught when I came to terms with the idea that I would be going home alone that night. When I got to my doorstep, I saw the dopey smiling face of my dog sat there waiting for me. Ah, oh, this guy. I didn't know whether to hug him or scold him. I was dirty, caked in dust and sweat and I needed a shower. When I got out of the shower, something interesting happened. My dog was growling. He was pointed towards my front door. I will update if anything else happens, but I'll never set foot in that hospital again. This happened when I was at university. There was a society dedicated to mountain hiking, and I signed myself up straight away. It had always been a passion of mine. My father used to take me hiking from a young age. We had a transceiver radio in our club room. We would check it regularly to see if people were doing okay on their hikes. One of the club members piped up and said, Hey guys, I'm pretty sure I'm getting an SOS transmission here. What do I do? We all headed to the radio and gathered around. It was there that we heard the undeniable sound of Morse code being transmitted. The sounds of dots and dashes over the crackly radio line. That's SOS without a doubt, one of the senior members of the club confirmed. He then set about repositioning the antenna to determine the location of the transmission. The signal was coming from the Joetsu border. We got permission to use the society-owned car and we headed off in the direction of the signal. We didn't have enough information on the situation to call in the police, or even to know if they were necessary at this point. We decided that we would call them once we checked out the situation. 
others opted to join us in their own personal vehicles. It took about three hours to find the location of the signal. It was coming from a forest area beneath Mount Tanigawa. We parked the car in the parking lot at the visitor's entrance. There were only a few cars parked there as it was a weeknight. We had a handheld radio with us to help us pinpoint the exact location of the signal. We checked it periodically to see if we were heading in the right direction. The radio started going crazy. It seemed like it was howling at one point. It usually isn't like this, so everyone was surprised. Following the leader of the group, we entered a mountain trail. It was night, and dense tree coverage made everything dark. But we quickly found a rucksack. We searched for a while longer, and discovered a body. It was too late. We got out of the area and made contact with the police. We were all understandably shaken up by this. I mean, we were only university students. We didn't want to leave the forest though. We needed to explain things to the police. None of us noticed until much later, but the radio stopped emitting the SOS signal shortly after we found the body. And of course, no one doubted that the poor soul who perished on the forest trail was the one who raised the signal. But think about it though, how could a corpse possibly do that? We had this confirmed when the police said that the hiker did not have a radio on his person. What made things even more disturbing was the fact that the hiker had died two days ago. How did no one hiking find the body in that time on a hiking trail? The police explained all this in a follow-up meeting with our hiking society. They said that they eventually found a radio in the forest, but it was submerged in a nearby stream. The strange thing was that there was lots of us there and we didn't see anyone in the area, but that's not to say there could have been someone nearby. Can you imagine that? Someone in the shadows summoning us to the grisly sight of a murder under the false pretense of an SOS and watching us discover their work. We were there late, and we watched all the cars leave that parking lot, and not one was left there. That might suggest that someone brought the body there. This is unresolved at this point. Who the hell raised the signal? We talk about this. We talk about that strange night regularly, especially in the autumn months, in most of our society meetings. This happened when I was in the second grade of elementary school. One night my parents had to leave to attend a wake, and they left me home alone to house sit. They told me that I was in charge of the house. I was to eat dinner, take a shower, and go to bed. They said that they would be back after midnight. I had never been alone in the house before. It was strange, but I wanted to enjoy this newfound freedom. So I was watching TV, feeling really powerful as I could choose whatever channel I wanted. We live in the rural countryside of Kyushu. Our neighbors are a couple of minutes away, so nights are usually very calm and quiet. I think it was about eight or nine o'clock. I had finished watching a TV show, and then the news came on. Boring, I thought. I guess it was time to take a shower and hit the hay. I was contemplating this massive decision while reading a manga comic, lying down on my bed. Then I heard a knock at the door. Oh, my parents are back home early, I thought as I went to the door. I looked through the frosted glass, and I saw a big shadow of a person out there. Now, my mum is only 150 centimeters tall, so it couldn't be her. Maybe it's my dad, I assumed. I called out. Hello? A deep male voice replied. Hi, little girl. Is your dad home? My dad was a bit of a drinker, and he often hung out with these booze hounds so I thought this might be one of his pals or something. So I carelessly responded, No, he's not here. He's at a funeral. There was a short pause. And what about your mother? I didn't know what to say. I knew my mum hung out with her friends and they went drinking too, so maybe this guy knew both of them or something. 
but something deep inside told me not to reply. I felt a bit suspicious. What do I do? I thought that no matter what I would answer with, I might end up making another mistake or getting into trouble somehow. Mum's not home either? The voice persisted. This was so strange, we never usually had people coming to the house at this time of night. This wasn't right. There was something about his voice, too. It didn't sound like the local accent. This wasn't good. I felt extremely anxious. I couldn't bring myself to say anything in response. Are you alone in there, little girl? I began to cry silent tears while standing stock still and silent. Can't you open the door for me? I have something I have to give your dad. I'm just here to drop it off. He said in a voice so extremely sickly, the kind of voice you hear when someone is trying to coax someone else into doing something. I mustered up enough strength to reply. Can you come back tomorrow? He didn't reply. He just started to violently turn the doorknob. I understood the man's intentions now, and it felt like an arrow of ice went through my heart. My throat closed up, and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. Then came the sound of his fist punching the frosted glass. Open it! He roared again and again. Please stop, I pleaded. It's so loud, I said. Then my brain kicked into gear and I ran into the living room and grabbed the house phone. But I didn't even know the number of the place where my parents were at. My parents had told me about people who call the police when they don't really need their help. Hoax calls. I was nervous, thinking I might get in trouble for doing a hoax call. While I was panicking about what to do, I heard the glass shatter in the hallway. He had breached the front door. A horrible thick arm shot through the hole in the glass. I remember he was wearing a jet black jumper. I screamed for help. I remember thinking this was more like a scene from a movie, not from real life. The arm was groping for the lock. While the arm was desperately probing for the lock, I heard another sound coming from outside. It was somebody shouting my name. Someone shouting that they had called the police. I wandered over to the door, and I saw the owner of this new voice. I jumped for joy. It was the voice of the older lady who lived next door. She had heard all the commotion and came to see what was going on. As she shouted that she had called the police, the man ran for it. I let her in. I was inconsolable. I just bawled my eyes out the whole night through. The police arrived about 30 minutes before my parents came back. When my parents did come back, they apologized again and again for leaving me by myself. In the end, we didn't know who the intruder was. My dad just assumed it was a robbery attempt. Just as a side note though, our town is located along the East China Sea in Kyushu, and there are a lot of suspicious ships around the ports. In addition, my town is famed for many unsolved missing persons cases. The police never found the man, but I often replay that moment in my head over and over. And thanks to that man, I have had countless sleepless nights. I don't like to think about what might have happened to me if my neighbor hadn't been there. We became very close with our neighbors after this, and my parents never let me house it again. This happened a few years ago, in my local cinema. I always loved going to the movies. I often went after work by myself. One day I was passing, and I saw that a film was showing that I had planned on watching on the weekend. I decided to catch a late night showing alone. My local cinema is located in front of a train station, which I use regularly. 
and it's part of a big shopping centre too. Weekday nights are very quiet, and sometimes you find yourself being the only one in the theatre. It's perfect. I was catching the final showing of the night, and that cinema was basically empty. There was only about four or five other spectators in the 200-seat theatre. After the trailers had finished, the house lights went down, and the cinema was dark. As soon as it was dark, someone came over and sat down next to me. It was a man in his forties. He sat in the seat on my immediate left. This was so weird because the cinema was basically empty. I didn't understand why he did this. Why would someone sit next to someone else when there are so many other seats available? Then I thought that it was perhaps his favorite place to sit or his usual spot. Still weird that he came and sat next to me. I mean, I can put up with someone sitting next to me if it's crowded, but, but not when there are only a handful of other people in the cinema. Stranger still, you have to pick your seat when you buy your ticket. So he must have known he would have been sitting next to someone. I decided to move. I grabbed my handbag and headed two rows behind, and more into the middle of the row. The film went on and it wasn't that interesting, or maybe I was a little distracted. But towards the end, the tension was building for an exciting payoff. It was at this point I heard breathing behind me. There shouldn't have been anyone behind me. I tried my best to subtly check behind without fully turning around. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had sat next to me was now behind me. Why? What was the point of all this? I couldn't make sense out of it, and to be perfectly honest, the man was beginning to creep me out. I'm not really a fan of the dark, and or strangers sitting behind me. Anything could happen. My mind tormented me with the terrifying possibilities. What if he stuck a knife through the back of my seat? Maybe because the scene I was watching was a tense one, that's why I began to imagine those horrible scenarios. I don't know. The man was acting strange. I was on edge. It was creepy. Even though the film was getting really good, I decided to move again. I decided I would sit kind of close to the exit. I would get a seat with nothing but the wall behind me, so I could finally relax and watch the end of the film. One problem though. When I stood up, I noticed that the man wasn't sitting behind me anymore. Where the hell did you go? I wondered probably to go and annoy someone else. I didn't care, I just approached the seat near the exit. As I got closer, chills raced up my spine. There he was, slumped in the chair, just in front of the one I wanted to sit in. He stared at me and grinned. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was scaring me, and he liked it. That was the final straw for me. I rushed out of the theater, and as soon as I walked out, I was running. Turns out that I ran too fast and I ended up hitting the floor. A member of staff asked me if I was alright. I sat in the lobby and that staff member tried to calm me down whilst I told her everything. I felt like such a fool for creating a scene. I mean the guy in the cinema hadn't done anything apart from sit near me. M maybe I had taken it all out of context. I stuck around and waited for everyone in the screen I was in to come out to the lobby. I never saw that man come out. I find that so strange. I don't know what he had on his mind or what he might have done, but I'm certain now that he was planning something. I don't go to the cinema alone anymore. This happened when I stayed in a cheap hotel in Ueno. I was visiting Tokyo to attend an old friend's wedding. The hotel was only a few minutes walk from the train station. It was just a simple, smallish business hotel on the outskirts of the downtown area. Since the hotel was old, the interior design and the room were pretty old. The room key had 
the old cylinder-style lock. I was more used to the modern card key, and you don't really see locks like that these days. When I first got into the elevator, I noticed that it creaked and made a heck of a noise. It was also really slow too. When I got into my room, I was surprised to see that it was cleaner than I had expected. One downside was that there was this weird musty odor, but I guess that that just came with the territory. I didn't care. The room was cheap and clean. I dropped my luggage and lay down on the bed. I heard a rattling noise as I did. Must have come from next door. Man, these walls are thin, I thought. I called my fiancé to let her know I arrived safely, and this is how the conversation went to the best of my recollection. I'm here. Uh, I can't really complain. You get what you pay for, right? My partner then fell silent. The conversation felt a bit awkward. What's the matter? I think it's just me. <laughs> what makes you ask? Hey, don't try and freak me out. It's probably just the thin walls. Oh yeah, because I'm such a big hit with the ladies. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. In the end, I managed to joke my way out of this peculiar accusation, and we made up, said our goodnights, and things were back to normal again. The hotel room fell silent after the call. It was quite eerie, and I felt an unexpected sense of loneliness. It was just a stifling sense of isolation, like I was the last human on Earth. What had brought this all on? Maybe I was spinning too many plates at once. Work, love life, planning a wedding, I don't know. This seems like a simple excuse though. I hadn't ever felt like that before, or since. That night, sleep wouldn't come. I'm usually the type who can sleep anywhere as soon as my head hits the pillow, I'm usually out for the count, but not that night. I just felt uncomfortable in every position I lay in. I felt like checking social media sites on my phone. I grabbed it and noticed one of my other apps had been running, the voice memo app. This wasn't that unusual since I used the app all the time for work, especially in meetings. I must have hit record by accident, I guess. I realized what had been recorded was my conversation with my fiance. I listened back to it, and right before she asked me if anyone was in the room with me, I heard something strange. It sounded like whispering. I definitely heard something, faint though it was. It was something. I turned up the volume and played it back again. I heard a voice. A female voice. I turned up the volume to the max, and I couldn't believe what I heard. How is this possible? It was some mindless voice repeating this over and over again, like some monotone chant. Let's die together. Let's die together. Let's die together. Chills raced up my spine as I heard those words. I held down the voice memo note and hit delete. It was still playing as I was deleting it. As I deleted it off of my phone, I heard, It came from inside the room, for sure. Even though it was past midnight, I grabbed my suitcase and ran downstairs. I left the hotel. I got another one, a more modern one. I just had to bite the bullet on the price. Nothing else really came of that night. I guess I can't complain. I spoke to a friend who's into the paranormal, and he said it was lucky that I was heading to a wedding. He said that the spirit, if it had attached to me, might have found joy in the celebration of life. He said I should be thankful I wasn't going to a funeral. Anyways, that's the last time I stay in a cheap old hotel to save a few bucks. This happened one night a few years back. 
I was a student at the time. I was working at a convenience store trying to save some cash for university. I was living with my parents. I walked a couple miles back home from my part-time job at the convenience store. I would usually get picked up, but my parents were out on a date. The fog was thick that night, and there was no one on the streets. It was a perfect autumn night. I was wrong, though. I noticed after about ten minutes that someone was walking behind me. I didn't pay it much mind, but when this person was taking every turning that I was taking on my route home, I grew concerned. I looked over my shoulder while crossing the road to see that the owner of those footsteps behind me was a man. I turned into my street and up to my house, and I was grateful to hear him turn off in another direction. It was quite foggy that night. The street lights were lit early, and since I had worked a long shift, I went over to the mailbox before going inside. I was expecting something. At that point in my life, I hadn't really had any paranormal experiences or been in the line of any inherent danger. That all changed that night though. While checking the mailbox, something appeared from the corner of my eye that made me turn to the right and face it. At first I thought that my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then I quickly realized that there was a figure at the other side of the street. I was fairly certain it was a man. Not the guy from before, I prayed. It was strange because he was just standing there completely still and I guessed that he was staring right at me. My fight or flight reflex kicked in and I quickly made my way to the front door with the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I inherently knew that there was something off about this situation and I needed to get out. I unlocked the door, turned to have a last look and I nearly fainted. The man was now at the end of my driveway. I needed to get inside, I needed to get behind a locked door. Once inside, I looked through the window, and he was gone. I was trembling in fear. I couldn't see where this guy was, and I couldn't decide whether or not to go turn the lights on. But I just continued to periodically check the window. I almost jumped out of my skin when my neighbor's dog started barking loudly. I was really frightened. My blood froze in my veins as I heard footsteps. Hearing footsteps approaching my front door, I ran, covering my mouth to prevent myself from screaming, and I looked through the peephole. The outdoor sensor light wasn't on, but I could see well enough due to the street lights, and it was light outside due to the fog. Barely breathing, I stared through the peephole and gasped in fear when a dark shadow appeared. I was sure it was that man. He had his hood pulled over his head, and he was now inches away from the door. Instinctively, I flipped the light switch and went back to look through the peephole. He was gone again. I raced around the house, turning every light on, while trying to find my phone. I was in such a panic I had no idea where I put my handbag. I was shaking in terror as I crept into the kitchen and I grabbed a knife from the knife block. The dogs had stopped barking and for a moment I thought that that man had gone to silence them. I was too frightened to look out of the window now. But then, then I heard my neighbor's voice yelling. I was saved. I won't repeat the language he used, but he made sure that creep was off of our property. He came over and when I was certain that that man was gone, I opened the door. We spoke for a while and he calmed me down. I even asked him to check all the rooms in the house. I was a bit embarrassed, but I cannot tell you how shook up I was. It seemed like hours had passed before my parents got home. I explained it all to them, and they told me I needed to make a statement to the police in the morning. After one more check on all the windows, I went to bed. Early the next morning, at around 2am, something woke me up and I sat bolt upright, straining my ears. The silence was deafening. I could hear my beating heart in my ears. It was aching with anxiety. I felt for sure that that man was back. I checked the windows. Nothing. I stayed up until the dawn. I never saw him again, and I don't really want to either. The whole experience terrified me. 
I always make sure the doors are locked no matter where I go. And ever since then, I've been afraid of the fog too. This happened when I was about seven years old, when I was at school. At that time, my classmate and I used to play in a mountain park. From our houses, it takes about 30 minutes by bicycle to get to the mountain. It only takes about 10 minutes to get to the summit. It's a pretty small mountain. Halfway up the mountain is a park, and at the summit, there is a shrine. There is a village by the mountain. The area is popular with the elderly, and families who enjoy forest walks. It gets really busy during vacation times. The park is usually very busy. My friends and I loved the park halfway up the mountain because it wasn't like an everyday neighborhood park. It had some really nice play equipment there. We would play until the sun set each night. One day in autumn, we were playing in that park, just me and my female classmate, who we will call M. She invited me climb to the top of the mountain. I knew that there was just a small shrine at the top, and it didn't seem as fun as all the great equipment in the park, like the slides and the sandpits, so I asked, why do you want to go to the top? She said that there was a small forest behind the shrine, and she had heard that there was an owl there. She wanted to see if she could find it. It was after five o'clock, the sun was going down. It was already beginning to get dark. My curfew was six o'clock. I didn't know if I could make it back in time, but M had her heart set on finding that owl. I knew her well. She was always on the edge of a tantrum, so instead of arguing, I thought, let's just go there quick and get back quick. It only took about five minutes to get to the summit anyway. Because it was getting late, there was no one around in the park or on the mountain trails. The forest which M wanted to go to so badly was surrounded by a vermilion fence. The tall trees of the forest swayed in silence. It looked pretty creepy. I wanted to go home. M ran towards the forest with an excited grin, turning back to yell, I found the entrance, come on! What she had found was a point in the fencing which had collapsed, but it was probably broken by someone. Beyond the broken red fencing was twisted barbed wire. I knew deep down that there was something wrong with this situation. I'm sure any other kid my age would have thought the same. We weren't supposed to go in there. Em didn't seem phased. She just crept past the barbed wire and through the gap in the smashed fence. Hey, stop Em, it's dangerous. We should go home before it gets too late. I would pipe up with things like that. We came this far, I'm not going back now, come on. She called. I couldn't persuade her to turn back. So with trepidation, I followed her into the forest. It was officially dark. The village below looked gloomy. In the forest there were these huge piles of fallen leaves. I remembered that they looked tall and bouncy. The ground was rough and uneven, with plenty of pitfalls and holes. I felt as if we were going to fall down one any second. We were walking no longer than ten minutes into the woods. M was in front, and she stopped and pointed at something. Hey, there's a house there. Why is a house in the woods? I wondered. It was a bit unnerving. I pleaded with her to turn back. Let's go have a look, M said with a wry smile. She started marching towards the house. We arrived on the right hand side of the house. It was made of wood, more of a cabin than a house, I realized. As we got closer, we saw no signs that it was inhabited. It seemed empty. I was tired of walking at this point. M ran off ahead. I couldn't give chase. I was observing the building from the outside when I heard her scream. Are you okay? I called to M. I ran in the direction I heard her scream. A few seconds later, I heard her shriek again. The first thing I saw was M's shadow. I could tell that she was shivering with fear. Then I saw her approaching, sniffling and sobbing. What happened? I yelled. She said nothing. She slowly raised her finger 
and pointed at the house. I looked in that direction and saw something terrifying. There was a huge amount of broken and smashed up dolls, their necks broken, their faces smashed. There were these stone monuments called Jizos, which were also destroyed. All these strange objects had been weathered and worn. They must have been collected and left there. Someone was building a collection. I stood there, unable to move. Goosebumps sprinting up my body. Then, from behind me, I heard a rustling sound. Like the sound of leaves being trodden on, we both simultaneously turned our heads in the direction of the sound. M said in a quiet and frightened voice, Someone's coming. The crunching sound of leaves was getting closer. We couldn't move. We had no place to run. We stared at each other, shivering. Run, M shouted. It echoed through the silence along the mountaintop. She grabbed my hand and I ran with her. She was pulling me along the uneven road. I nearly tripped. It was so stressful. As we ran, I still heard that crunching on leaves sound coming from behind. What the hell was chasing us? I was frightened, but curious. This morbid curiosity forced me to turn my head to look back as we ran. I turned and saw a huge silhouette of a person, head to toe in black robes, running as fast as they could towards us. I was so scared, I couldn't take my eyes off of the figure behind us. I turned back to look in the direction we were running. In that instance, I connected with something sharp and extremely painful. It was the barbed wire wrapped around the red fencing, the point that we entered that horrible little forest. I cut my forehead so deeply, it was agony. I screamed in pain. I had to stop for a second. I put my hand to the wound, and when I pulled it back, it was slick with my blood. They're still chasing us, M shouted. I fell to the ground. I thought I was going to pass out. M grabbed my hand and yanked me to my feet and pulled me towards the exit. I could see the panic in her eyes as she glanced at me and then towards the person running at us. We hobbled through the gap in the red fencing and ran towards the village below. After that, we got home safely, but it was after 8 o'clock, way beyond my curfew. That wasn't my biggest problem though. My parents went crazy about the huge gash in my forehead. Sixteen years later, and I still bear the scars to this day. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of that day and how lucky Em and I were to escape. Something strange is definitely going on in the woods behind that shrine. This happened in the summer of 1986, or maybe 1987. Some friends and I wanted to go climb Mount Tanigawa. And how you would do that back in the day would be to take the train from Ueno to Echigozawa. If you set off at around 11, then you could be at Doai Station for about midnight. Now this station was an interesting one. Not only was it a great place to begin the hike up the mountain, but there was no bullet train around this time a new resort like there is now. It's now called Gala Yuzawa. Back then the rules were a little more relaxed and there were ways to bend the rules in your favor. Let's say if you boarded the train at the point that I did, that you wouldn't have to show your ticket to anyone or even buy a ticket. Doai Station was an unmanned station so it really was an easy place for people to get off without having their tickets checked. So all anyone had to do was just bolt down the stairs. I heard from some friends that the only time attendees turned up was to check the tickets when a train arrived, not departed. And that really wasn't that often. I was there with two friends, two fellow mountain climbers. I will refer to them as T and H. Since we were students and we weren't rich, we thought that if we spent the night at the unmanned station, we would save some money and avoid some train fares. We watched all the other commuters, mainly hikers, disappear. We had a plan to get up early, 
and be on the first train out before the ticket checkers would be there. The plan was foolproof, right? The train we needed would depart from the underground. It was incredibly cool down there, even though it was summer. We could hear random drips echoing from the tunnel the train passes through. There was a small waiting room by the station platform. It was nice and bright in there, so at least we had a light source. We decided to head in there and take a nap since we had gotten a little cold. We dragged all of our luggage in there and hunkered down for the night. Several freight trains passed through in the middle of the night. I remember waking up as they roared by and wondered where I was each time. I hate that feeling. I was mildly annoyed that I seemed to be the only one who woke up each time. I can't remember what time in the night it was, but I woke up again to hear the sound of footsteps echoing around the empty platform. I focused on the sound and tried to pinpoint the location of the footsteps, and they sounded as if they were approaching the waiting room. Someone's coming, but who, I wondered. I decided to lie still just in case it was a member of staff or another hiker looking for a chat or something to borrow. The footsteps stopped outside the waiting room. At this point, I imagined that whoever was out there was another person looking for a place to sleep for the night. Awkward seconds tumbled into minutes. I couldn't hear any further footsteps. How long will they wait outside? I didn't get a hint or a sign that this person was about to enter the waiting room. It was annoying, so I popped my head up and looked towards the entrance. There was no one there. My spine froze. The whole waiting room seemed to have grown cold in the blink of an eye. Did I mishear those footsteps? Did I imagine them? I didn't mind which option, just as long as I was able to convince myself of one. I started to sweat. Time trickled by without incident. I thought about changing my shirt since I felt gross, but I couldn't be bothered as I was so tired. I ended up falling asleep. A while later, I awoke again. This time, I could hear a man's voice speaking in a low tone mumbling or muttering. This was dovetailed with his heavy breathing. I opened my eyes wide. I couldn't make out the words the voice was whispering at first. After a while, I made out words such as, please, and let me. It sounded as if he was asking for someone or something. His voice had an undercurrent of sorrow to it, like he was in pain. I wondered if it was someone outside the waiting room who couldn't get in. So again, I sat up and looked towards the entrance, and I couldn't see anyone there. The fluorescent light was flickering above my head. I could still hear this mumbling, pain-stricken voice. I started to feel sick, seasick, like the room was spinning. Is this a dream? I wondered, or perhaps hoped. Maybe it was my imagination, since I hadn't been sleeping much on this trip. My friend, H., started twitching in his sleep. I started to worry about him, so I shook him awake. He woke up and inhaled and exhaled deeply. Oh, sleep paralysis, I am so glad you woke me. I don't want to go to sleep again. Oh, are you staying awake? He looked petrified. There shouldn't be anyone else down here but us this time of night. Or was it early morning? It was far too early for a member of staff to be here. We woke up tea and decided, as a group, to head to the overground section of the station. We didn't want to be underground anymore. We grabbed all our heavy hiking gear and turned towards the 500 or so stone steps, sighed, and started to climb them. Without any gear, it takes about 20 minutes to climb these stairs. Just as a side note, T told us before that there was a rumor that if you counted the steps on the way down, then you would meet an accident climbing Mount Tanigawa. As we climbed back up the stairs, not counting them of course, we felt hot air being blown our way from above ground. When we finally got to the top of the stairs, we saw a few other climbers sleeping in the station. They must have had the same idea as us. I didn't know exactly what time it was, but I knew that it was one of those dark hours before dawn. We settled down close to the other climbers and I felt a bit less tense. H pulled out his camping stove and set about boiling some water. 
I guess it was an early breakfast for us. We didn't have much else to do. Did you guys sleep all right last night? H asked. He then proceeded to tell us that he had a disturbing and frightening dream in the underground. He said that he thought he heard the sound of someone walking towards where we were sleeping. In his dream, he said he saw someone peering at us with a look of such unspeakable terror on their face. It was a man. He couldn't remember what he was wearing, but he was certain that the man was staring at us. When he met the eyes of the man looking in on us, he said that he had never seen a face so desperate. He said that the dream troubled him so much because he was unable to help or understand the reason behind that man's glare. He recognized it as desperation and utter horror. This was really out of character for H. He was older than us and I had never known him to lie. He never bragged or tried to pull pranks either. This is why I got such chills when he recounted a similar story to what happened to me without me telling him what had happened. We were silent while we ate breakfast for a while. I didn't want to talk anymore. I was exhausted and still shaken up. H then said while eating, Many people go missing in this area. I bet a lot of them meet with foul play. With that, we all stayed silent and we fell asleep as the sun was rising in front of the ticket gate. We were all severely lacking in sleep. We woke up when the station started to get a little busier. This was the first time in this station I didn't mind getting awoken. We were happy to get the hell out of there. I could understand if it was just my experience, but the fact that H had the same experience as me, that is something that's always frightened me.